Start? Okay. Welcome back, CBS class. We're going to sing a song called All the People Said Amen. Please rise. <laughs> Please rise. Thank you. You are not alone if you are lonely when you feel afraid. You're not the only. We are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and be free. It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Oh. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you're rich or poor, well, it don't matter. Weak or strong, you know, love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And he so loved the world, he said his son to save us all. All the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, who his love never ends. And all the people said amen. Blessed all the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed all the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed all the people hungry for another star. This is a kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, who his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Thanks, that was a great song. Let's pray. Father, you are the one that gives us everything. You are the faithful God. You gave us a faith that equals all the apostles. And you gave us everything that's required for life and godliness through knowledge of you, the Most High Lord God. So we pray for your presence tonight. We pray that we will listen to words that Peter spoke because they are so relevant for us today. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So Peter starts off with this, his second letter. It's probably two to three years after the first letter. He's an old man, and he says his death is imminent, and it's going to be a gruesome death. So this letter was written right around 67 to 68 A.D. He's writing to the same people he wrote to the first time. Back in 1 Peter, he was giving them milk. Remember he talked about it? Now he's giving them meat because they're going to need it because the false teachers are coming. Peter wanted the churches to know when he's gone, and all the other apostles are gone, that they have the word of God that's even more sure, and they can stand on it. They can stand on that rock, and they cannot be led, led astray if they just promised it. That's what this book is about. He's saying no matter what, you can stand on the faithfulness of God. So let's start it off. Simon Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
First and foremost, Peter led that he is a servant. He learned from the greatest teacher of all time, Jesus. And I said it last week, and even Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Peter is that type of thought. He's also an apostle. He has the authority to teach them. And then he goes on, to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice how he said that our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're one and the same in Peter's mind. And so what he's saying here is you have the same faith I have, the same righteousness that I have because there's no hierarchy in how we come to God. Paul writes about there, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, free or slave, man or woman. We all come the same way. And that's what he's saying. The faith is equal. And then he does something. Paul does it too, but Peter specifically did this. And remember, he's writing mostly to a Jewish audience. He said, may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace is a Greek greeting. That's how the Greeks would greet you, through grace. Jews would say, through peace, through shalom. And what shalom means is not an absence of conflict. It means completeness, fulfillment. And that fulfillment is in Jesus. And as you appropriate that grace and that peace in your life, you're going to grow in the knowledge of God and of Jesus. And the more you grow in that knowledge, the more your peace and the more your strength of your walk will be. And that's what he's trying to do. And this is really important because this is Peter's final testament. This is like what you would write your children when you knew you were going to die. Giving them instructions of how to live their life. Who they are. And that's what he was doing. He also prophetically saw something that was going to happen. They were already being persecuted from the outside. The Romans and the pagans made no light thing. They took joy in persecuting them. But now he prophetically saw what was coming. The greatest danger of all. The false teachers from within were going to strike. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and even Satan comes as a what? A light. He comes as a false light. So now they're going to have to fight the battle from within. So they're going to get persecuted from the outside, and they're going to have their chain pulled by the false teachers from the inside, and we're going to learn about that next week. Scott's going to lead us through that next week as we study chapter 2. But that's what he, he was getting at. But he wants them to know the grace and peace of this knowledge in abundance is for them as they grow deeper. It's so utterly important for us to remember. In order to withstand the forces, both outside and inside, because let me tell you, false teachers are really good at their job. Like Paul said, even Satan comes as an angel of light. Because so much of what they say is in truth. In the church in the United States, we did, Marcia and I sat through a seminar, I'll go real quick, I told you about it last week, but they did a study on the Chinese Micro churches, home churches, and they felt because they weren't trained in theology, there would be a lot of bad teaching. Well, they did a detailed study, and I don't know how they do these things, but they did it. Five percent of those little micro churches were heretical. 
Another 15% were in air, some serious, not, some not so serious. But 80% of them is what we would call Orthodox Christianity. So they needed something to compare it with. So they did the same forces on the U.S. church. I'm talking global. I'm not picking on any one church. But they found 20% of the U.S. churches were heretical. Another 30% were in error, some of it very serious, and only 50% of the churches were orthodox. So Peter saw this was going to happen to these little micro churches spread out across that he was writing, and he was warning them, you're going to have to eternalize and appropriate both the grace and peace of God so that you grow no closer to him. This is nothing new. Jesus wrote in Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. But he also goes on next and tells you what happens if you don't take them. Your, hand, your house is built on sifting sands. And when the wind comes, and the rains come, it gets washed away. That's what Peter's talking about right now. And that's what the, why these two verses are important. Quickly, last week, I talked a little bit about Richard Wormbrandt, one of the heroes of the faith. When I met with him, I, I mean, he was like meeting the Apostle Paul to me. He was such a godly man. But you know what? He, in his book, Tortured for Christ, and I highly recommend it. He was in prison for 14 years and they tortured him continually. They, not just him, every Christian. And they also, they're equal opportunity, so they tortured the Jews and even the intellectuals that didn't agree with them, the atheists. But when they tortured him, they got tired of it because he kept his grace and he kept his peace and he said the torturers would take a lunch break in the middle of their torturing, and that's when he witnessed to them. And he brought a number of guards to the Lord. Can you imagine keeping your peace that well? We're going to need it because the tribulation is coming. We're in a tribulation as a matter of fact. In some places in this world, it is very severe. But we need to be rooted and grounded. Peter knew that his death was coming and he knew the church was going to be under attack and the more dangerous one is from within. But he said this, that no matter what, you can stand on the faithfulness of God. So that's what we need to do. We need to appropriate the grace and peace of God. So now we come to one of my new favorite verses. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election because if you do these things, you will never stumble. We have the power of his Holy Spirit in us. He's given us everything we need, and he laid it out. Your faith brought you to the Lord, but now build on that faith with goodness, with knowledge, with self-control, with endurance, with godliness, with mutual affection. Some of them say brotherly love and love. This is not a pick-and-choose list. This is a do-it-all list, and we need to do it. They build on each other. And you need all of them. If we continue to do this, we'll grow in faith. And he gives us a warning in verse 8a. It's the counter on fruitfulness. So what does 8a say? For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless and not, or unfruitful. I just stated in the negative. It'll keep you from that. The positive is that you'll gain fruitfulness in the in the Lord, in the Jesus, the Messiah. You, it will help you avoid developing spiritual blindness. What does it go on to say? 
the person who lacks these things, these seven things I laid out, that Peter laid out, and I'm repeating, if you, you will be blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing of the sin. So to avoid spiritual blindness, practice these things. Read, get in the Word. Be in a small group. Have people invest in your life so if you stray, and we all do, they can pull you back in before you fall. This will keep you from stumbling. And then give all the more diligence to make sure your election is sure. God elected us. He chose us and elected us, but we're the ones that confirm that election. What does that mean? By living the walk. By doing these things. These things, it's not a one and done our faith. It's called sanctification. You're saved by grace, but now you have it. You got to work on it because you can lose your faith. I've been one who's done it. But if you're disciplined, you'll keep going through. It'll keep you, avoid stumbling into various acts of sin. And my, one of my other favorite verses from this study is for in this way, Entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. I want that. I don't want anything to stop that. And if you want to live a fruitful life, do these seven things. They're very simple to say, but they're hard to do. That's what called growth is. See, we don't spend enough time doing this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to confirm your call and election. If you do this, you'll never stumble. That's what Peter's warning them. You're going to, persecution from the outside was a fact. And he's saying it's going to come from the inside. False teachers, and they're deadly. You're going to learn about that next week. They are deadly because they can rob you of your faith. Let me tell you, a quick story that illustrates that. And it's a simple story, but listen to it. I have a nine-year-old granddaughter who likes to wrestle. Her name is Alina. I call her Alina because that was my grandmother's name. And Lena has a physical trait that's a blessing from God. You can't coach it. She's lightning fast. And she can go to zero and a hundred in under a second, it seems. But you know, when she was wrestling, she was getting beat, even though she's faster than everybody she wrestled, because she had to think through her moves. But the other grace that she has is, my daughter is a taskmaster, and she works with her to practice these moves. And you know, she was getting beat by all the boys until she didn't. And what happened? All that practice, all that reputation, repetition, all that focus, she no longer thought about doing the move. She did them. It was reactive. It was instinct to her. And I, just a little bit of bragging, Marsha, I'm sorry, but she's our granddaughter, our oldest one. She wrestled a guy that was already made it to the state tournament, and he was ranked high up, one, two, or three, and she wrestled him, and she beat him because when he did a move, she countered it without thinking. She was so quick. And he, had not, he was stronger than her, but he was not close to being as quick. And she beat the kid, and like little boys do sometimes when they get beat up by little girls, he cried. <laughs> he thought he was going to be, she was going to be a pushover because she used to lose until she didn't. That's the same thing with what I'm talking about for us. Do the stuff and you'll get stronger. You'll get beat up a little bit, maybe a lot, but the more you do it, the more you grow in the word, the less likely it's going to happen until someday you can be like Richard Wormbrandt and have peace in the sign of persecution. Such a peace that your torturer or your tormentor will come to the Lord because 
They know they see something that's not natural. And we have that power because we have the Holy Spirit. Our walk with the Lord is not a one and done thing. We need to spend time with him. We need to pray. We need to study. We need to learn how to love the person that's just so insensitive they insult you half the time. We need to get a thicker skin. We need to do the things that Peter laid out. If we do those seven things, Peter said, you won't stumble. You won't. And that's what we need to do. I can tell you this, when I'm in a crowd and I watch, I watch a couple times uh, Gentiles witnessing to Jews, and they get torn up because they have never, never done it before. They don't know the approach. I have. I've been spit upon. I've been humiliated. So now you can sit and you can talk at their level. You can do the same thing if you work at it. I'm not that good, but I practice. And that's what you're called to do. I asked a group I, I taught on the Kings at the church I go to. I said, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I want you to answer this rhetorical question. How many of you have read through the Bible, cover to cover, 10 times? I said, how about 15 times? How about two decades, 20 years? Have you read through the Bible each year 20 times? You have to answer that question. But if you don't know the word of God, what are you standing on when a storm comes? You're on shifting sands. And then you're susceptible to false teachers. And trust me on this, they are very good. Some of them are lousy, but the best ones are very good. That's why, as I was looking at another survey, of our young people under 35, only 15% who say they're Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. Can you believe it? That's Orthodox Christianity. Get in the Word and study it. No matter what, you can stand on the faithfulness of God's word. The only question is, will we know what God's word is saying? Because we study it. That's what he wants us to do. Then we get to the last part. Peter teaches the reliability of the word. Transfiguration is a great story. I long to have what Peter had. To be able to see Jesus transfigured, the Shekinah glory of God, the Shekinah glory that caused everyone when they dedicated the temple to fall on their faces because they couldn't stand the glory of God. And see him transfigured, I want that. And then to hear the very voice of God, this is my son, I'm well pleased with him. In other words, everything he's doing, I'm happy with. And I know you guys are taking some flack, and I know he's going to get crucified, but I'm happy with him. So go do what he says. Do what he says. I wish I had that. But you know what Peter said? He's going to be dead in probably less than a year. Paul is already dead. So is James. I think the only one survived, well, Jude's still alive, Jesus' brother. But he was going to die shortly. Thomas is dead. Matthew's dead. John's going to live for another 30 years. But he's the last one. So when they're gone, how do you know? And that's what Peter's saying. We have something more sure than my eyewitness. We have the very word of God. And it wasn't made up by man. Because who would? what man would make up a story as messy as the Bible? Think about it. He lays, God lays bare what our sins are, and it's ugly. It's a family story. It's like all of our families. None of them are perfect. So let's study, and what do we learn from that word? Peter said, it's more sure. 
You're coming from darkness, so no matter what you see, it's not going to be clear. But this is clear. This is clear. It's God's word. And Jewish tradition and biblical tradition says that word was not written by men. They may have penned it. It may be their personality or their style, but the word came from the mouth of the living God. Paul said in Timothy, it's God breathed. That he didn't make up because that's what the scripture says. Those prophets didn't say those things because they cleverly made it up. David wrote Psalm 22. When did David get tortured so bad you could see his bones? When did he get pierced? So what was he prophetically saw exactly what Jesus went through. And when you read that with Isaiah 53, man, it's hard. Mitch Glazer, when he witnessed to his mother, and I think a couple years ago, you, most of you met him, he read to her from Isaiah 53, and she said, stop it, I told you not to talk about the New Testament and don't talk about Jesus. He didn't. He said, Mom, it's Isaiah 53. It's in our book. Sid Ross' father accused him of changing his Bible, his Hebrew Bible. He said, look at it. It's your inscriptions in it. The rabbi signed it. It's in your scripture. He said, nah, you had to change it. It sounds like Jesus. That's a prophetic word. Who could think up Isaiah 53? What person could think that up? It's heavenly words, and that's what God is saying. No matter what, we can stand on that faithfulness. As we come out of darkness, the light shines. And what is the morning star? It's Jesus, and we have him in our heart. Let's do the six thing, the seven things. Let's study the word. Let's be the light of the world that we're called to be. Israel is supposed to be the light of the world to the Gentile world. Pretty dim. But we're called to be the bright morning star. Jesus empowered us with his ruach, his spirit. Let's go out and do it. That's what Peter's saying you got to do this because it's coming. The false teachers, they're coming. And they turn this world upside down. They rob you of your faith. But they can't rob you of your faith if you're standing on the rock. And you know the word. It's like Eve when the serpent said to her, what did he say? Well, we can't eat from the fruit or even touch it. He never said you couldn't touch it. He said you couldn't eat it. And so they subtly change things. And that's where death comes. 2,000 years ago, Peter reminded the church in Asia Minor the very things that he said to them is true for us in our day. The question is, will we stand on the faithfulness of God's word, no matter what we face. Because if we do, we get that crown of glory. And I want it. I don't know about you, but I want it. So I'm going to do it. And I ask that you join me in that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that the divine power has given to us by you, the Holy Spirit, in our life, everything that is required for life and godliness through the knowledge of you, Lord. Your glory and goodness has been given to us. You've given us the power to do that. So, Lord, I pray that we do it. I pray that we stand on your word, because you said, Jesus, in Matthew 24, 22, that a, a 
suffering, a tribulation is going to come that's so severe if you didn't cut it short, even your elect would fall. And the only way we can stand up is by your faithfulness. The only thing we can do to fight it is by standing on your word. So, Lord, I pray that. I pray that we get that vision and that we practice these things so our faith will be rock solid and people will see our light and you will receive the glory. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.